Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and it's time for your weekly wrap up. I'm a little under the weather today. I was uh, sick with like allergies or some low grade fever or something. My kids just have been giving me all these crazy viruses, but I am feeling much better now. So we're gonna pull, uh, carry forward here. Hopefully my voice doesn't sound too bad. And today on the wrap up, we're going to cover whether or not I get bored doing what I do here on the channel. We're gonna talk briefly about password managers. We're going to look at YouTube favoring smaller creators over larger ones perhaps in the wake of some new algorithmic changes that have happened. And we'll cover the GDPR and why I think it's going to make a lot of lawyers rich. So let's get into it. Now, before we get into the rest of the wrap up, I wanna thank our newest supporters here on the channel. Tom Albrecht gave a gold level contribution on Patreon this month, and Dave Parker contributed as well. I wanna thank both of them for their generous contributions to the channel and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis, along with everyone who watches on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now, we don't have an advertiser this week, but we do have a non-ad, an affiliate link for a service that I use quite a bit here, and that is audible.com. Uh, they sell audiobooks, and they also have a subscription plan that if you uh, frequently listen to audiobooks like I do, is a pretty good deal because the subscription costs less than the books usually cost if you purchase them outright. So I highly suggest going the subscription route if you want. And I just got done listening to Bad Blood, uh, which was a book diving into all the bad things that happened at Theranos. And if you're not familiar with Theranos, uh, they are a blood testing company that claimed to have a machine that could do a whole uh, litany of blood tests with only a simple finger prick. However, that technology never got off the ground properly and they were moving forward even though their technology just wasn't there yet to provide the testing that they were uh, basically selling to people. And they managed to get a lot of investment money. They were able to convince a lot of very high profile people to invest in the company and get on the board like uh, Henry Kissinger and uh, a couple of other very well-known people that have been in a number of presidential administrations here in the country. And it really shows you how uh, easy it is sometimes to dupe people if you can tell a good story. And this one certainly is uh, something worth listening to if you are interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, you can find it at Audible, and uh, the author that wrote this also was the person behind the Wall Street Journal expose on Theranos that started this entire investigation essentially into the company. And he not only tells the company's story, but also his story as a reporter and how whistleblowers came to him and gave him uh, the information he needed to start his investigative work into what was going on there. Really crazy story, and, and I thought a pretty good book actually, so definitely check it out at the link down below. So let's take a look at the week in review, and on the Extras channel I unboxed three different items, two of which made it to the main channel this week for a full review. Uh, those items included the WD My Passport Wireless SSD, which is a portable NAS device that has an SD card backup function that works pretty nicely. And we looked at the Lenovo Yoga 730, which is an update of one of my favorite laptops of last year, which was the 720. And this one now has a quad core processor versus the dual core in the prior edition. And we also looked at the Nvidia Shield, which is now getting Android 8 Oreo delivered to it via an over the air update. And that is slowly rolling out to Shield owners. So if you don't have it yet, you will in probably a week or so, maybe a little bit more. It's one of these staged rollouts that they're doing to make sure everything is working correctly. And uh, I got it on one of my 16 gigabyte units and I also showed you in that video how to use Plex with a new feature that allows you to move your database to an external hard drive, uh, which makes the 16 gigabyte version a little bit more practical as a Plex server. And one of the other things that I'm really impressed with with NVIDIA is just how much they're supporting this product several years after its release. I think it's had now uh, three or four major Android updates over the course of its three or four year life cycle, which is almost unheard of with Android boxes these days. Uh, so kudos to NVIDIA for really keeping up with their product updates on this great TV box. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind. And this is week 64 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. And this week I saw an article on TubeFilter about some large YouTube creators complaining once again about people not getting notified of videos getting posted. And now it looks like there might be some experiments going on with the subscription feed and driving it by an algorithm and not by chronology. And some people are getting upset with that. And what I think is going on here actually is that YouTube is trying to bring more eyeballs to lesser known creators. Because if you log in and you see the same you know, 15 different people that you watch every week, the platform might get stale. And I think what they're doing is trying to direct more content 
to viewers of things that they haven't seen before. Is that good or bad or indifferent? I think it really depends where you are in the ecosystem here. If you're uh, on the top, you do risk losing uh, some viewers as a result. But if you're like me in the middle and others who are just starting out, I think there's a lot to be gained here. And what I uh, did this morning was just kind of go through my watch time on my channel because uh, this is ultimately how YouTube measures your worth to the platform. And looking at this year versus last year with the same date range, kind of a year-to-date analysis here, uh, my watch time is up about 19% over last year, and the channel hasn't grown all that much in that period of time. So views are up slightly, but watch time is up significantly. And even if you compare us back to the January 2016 number there, views are about the same, but again, watch time is significantly higher. So what this tells me is that, uh, at least by how YouTube measures my success, which is watch time, I am growing. And I think that's a result of the algorithmic changes they are making. They're trying to get more fresh content in front of people. I'm seeing new stuff in my recommended feed all the time that I'm not subscribed to. I'm finding new creators more often than I can recall seeing them in the past. And this will undoubtedly hurt the big folks uh, but the little guys and gals who are starting out, or those again in the middle, I think are going to do better here. And I think that's exactly what's going on. So I don't look at a lot of these algorithmic changes as always a bad thing. I think there is some value here, especially when you dig into your numbers and see how you've been doing over the last year or so. I would say that my experience here may not be indicative of everybody's experience, but I'm seeing growth even though all these crazy things are happening on the algorithm side, but uh, nonetheless, things are doing okay here. What I am exploring are some alternatives that I can get uh, my videos out to people when I post them. So I'm looking at uh, doing an email blast if you want to subscribe to it where I can uh, tie my YouTube channel's RSS feed to my email service and just blast out an email every time I upload something. So I will be looking at ways to make sure you stay notified. But uh, in my opinion, the best way to get notified is to click the bell uh, because that bell will push out notifications whenever I do upload videos most of the time because some people say it's not been working too well for them, but I'm finding uh, the bell has been working okay for me. We'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers, and our first question comes in from Greg Ernst, who is wondering if I ever get bored doing what I do full time, and the answer is definitely no. I do not get bored. In fact, I've been doing this now for about three or four years full time for about a year, year and change at this point, and uh, I don't get bored. I really do enjoy what I do. I like interacting with viewers. I think the uh, channel's growth, both in watch time, as you saw before, but also subscribers and just overall uh, you know, engagement uh, has really been a big motivator for me to keep going. So I do try to upload at least four videos a week, the wrap up and three different reviews. And um, I've been able to maintain that you know, throughout the year and a half I've been doing this full time. And it uh, really does keep me going. Sometimes I just don't have as much time as I would like. Some products take longer to evaluate, and that sometimes means that I've got to do a little bit extra work on the weekend just so I have enough stuff to uh, get to my publishing goals for the week. But generally, this has been a very enjoyable career process to take on, and uh, it's been a great period of growth here for the channel, so that has been a good thing. I think if I ever saw you know, growth taper off or I started to see things beginning to decline and maybe I would, you know, look at this again. But um, I am really motivated and really enjoying what I do. And I'm really liking the fact that I'm seeing a very steady, predictable chain of growth here that I'm uh, looking to keep, keep running with and see where it goes. And then I really want to focus on some ways to scale what I do so that I can uh, help others do what I do and uh, start sharing their thoughts on the consumer electronics industry and the world. So stay tuned. Always more to come. I'm always thinking about uh, some new things to do. And uh, if anything, going full time has been a real uh, benefit because I have more free time now because I used to pretty much work as hard as I do now, but I was doing that in addition to working full time. Uh, so now I'm able to take an evening off, cook dinner, hang out with the family, uh, do stuff on the weekend sometimes too. So I've really been uh, enjoying the fact that I do have time to do this job and still have some personal time as well. And last week we were talking about the need for better authentication in the 21st century, but the reality is uh, we still need to use passwords until somebody comes up with something better. And Saturn Otaku reminded me about password managers, something I haven't talked about here on the channel uh, in the past, or at least not recently. And he's using Dashlane right now. I'm using LastPass, which is another good one. And the reason why I use a password manager is because I maintain a separate password for every single service that I use that requires a password. And as a result, 
I'm a little more secure that way. In fact, the passwords that LastPass generates are a bunch of random gibberish. It's like you know, 15 or 20 characters of random numbers, letters, and characters. And uh, that way, it's harder to just brute force guess my password. And also, because it's generating a unique password for every site that I visit, uh, it makes it really hard if somebody were to hack a website and get my password from it. They can't just go around to some other websites that I might be logged into, use that same username and password combination, and then uh, access my personal information. This has been happening a lot over the last couple of years, especially uh, after Adobe got compromised, where not only did email addresses get out, but also the passwords associated with those email addresses got out. And my account was one that uh, had a password that I was using on a few other websites. And what do you know, somebody was able to uh, log into another account of mine using that Adobe information and siphon off a lot of personal data. That was a bit of a headache for a little while. So this is a real problem. And a password manager uh, will at least help you set up a unique password for each site. You don't have to worry about remembering the password because it's stored in the password manager. I've got a great Chrome plugin for LastPass that I use when I want to log into a website. Uh, there's also an iOS and Android app, so when I'm on a site or an app using my phone, I can easily access the passwords that way as well. It's gotten a lot better on uh, iOS lately as well. So uh, password managers are highly recommended. I've got mine locked down by two-factor authentication as well. Uh, LastPass and all the more reputable password managers will also uh, pre-internet encrypt your data. So you're being encrypted before you store your password information in the cloud, making it very difficult uh, for somebody to go in and hack that data. But you still want to have a very secure password to unlock your password manager overall. And one of the things that I like about LastPass is that it's constantly doing an audit uh, to make sure I'm not duplicating passwords on more than one site and also making sure that my uh, main password is staying secure as well. Great services out there. Definitely check out uh, any number of good password managers and use one because I think it's really important these days, especially given how often uh, even high-end reputable sites get hacked. And Duncan Cunningham wrote in this week about all the emails he's been getting from uh, various services that he doesn't recall signing up for. And you likely have been getting a bunch as well because of the GDPR that took effect this week. And this is a new regulation in the European Union uh, that has international consequences because companies that do business in Europe are subject to this law even if they're not headquartered there. And there's a lot of uh, stiff penalties involved with this, which is why uh, you're starting to see this stuff get out there. So I figured we would explore what the GDPR is all about. Now, GDPR is short for the General Data Protection Regulation, and this means, in the EU at least, that you now own all of your data, including stuff that was collected about you from advertising companies and Google and Facebook and everything else. So you have the right to request that data, and they have to give it to you within a certain time span. Uh, they also have to uh, basically respect your right to be opted out of data collection. So if you say, I no longer want to be followed around the internet by your cookies, they have to turn that off and keep that stuff off, or they can face very strict penalties, which we'll talk about in a second. And another pillar of this new law is that you have to give consent to have your information tracked by uh, websites or other third parties, which means that if I go to your website and you're you know, running a bunch of ads on the screen from a bunch of ad networks, I have to consent for you uh, to be able to track me to provide that advertising. And that's a big change because before, typically, uh, that consent has been buried in a privacy policy. The user was never explicitly asked whether or not they want their data collected. Now in the EU, uh, you're going to get a window up on screen that says accept or not accept. If you don't accept, the website might just turn all the ads off, which might actually make the site run faster. Uh, or they could deny you access. Basically, this is it now. It's explicit in front of the user, not buried in a privacy policy somewhere. Explicit consent is required. And this is also why you've been seeing these crazy emails in your inbox over the last week, because many of these websites have no idea who's in the EU and who isn't. So it's safer just to change the privacy policy uh, throughout the entire world and notify you about that to uh, cover their butts in case anybody comes after them with a GDPR lawsuit. They can say that they were in compliance before the GDPR took effect. 
We notified you of changes. And I think also a lot of companies that were adding people to email lists without explicit permission now in the EU have to get explicit permission to continue communicating with you. So I saw a number of these emails come through saying, hey, if you don't uh, you know, opt back in, we're not going to continue sending you email anymore. So uh, there's going to be a lot of smaller email lists out there. And if you are in the EU, you might notice getting less email from uh, many places that you didn't recall signing up for on the internet. Now, if you do opt in for something, the law also requires that you have the ability to withdraw your consent and opt out, including having all of your information given to you so you can see what people have collected about you, and also give you the option, in addition to opting out of future data collection, to have your past information wiped clean. And I think this is going to be the hardest thing for many of these big data advertising firms to be able to do. Uh, the internet has largely been an, a free advertising supported platform. There's a lot of technologies that have sprung up over the decades uh, to basically follow us around everywhere and build profiles about individual users. And I'm not sure how easy it's going to be uh, for these big data firms to all work in coordination with each other to scrub an individual's record of travels clear from everything. And I think there's going to be uh, a lot of lawsuits that are going to be happening soon uh, because of that difficulty. They just were not designing this system to allow the uh, user to opt out, and now they're going to have to figure it out. There are some other opt out things to think about too, because if you go on some websites, you can opt out of certain data providers that are on those sites collecting information about you. There's a great website called the GDPR Hall of Shame, uh, which has a lot of great information about some of the uh, less than uh, kosher methods some of these websites have been doing to adjust to this new law, uh, including Yahoo here, for example, that if you decide to opt out of data collection, they present you with a list of easily 200 different ad networks that they're a part of, and you can decide which ones you want to be in or out of. They did apparently add a deselect all option to this list, which apparently uh, involves a pretty large scroll area. You can see the, the little scroll bar here and how much farther it has to go to get to the bottom of the list. But um, I don't know what half of these things are. Uh, so if you want to get out of it completely, you can deselect all. Interestingly enough, this is available only in Europe. I can't opt out as a United States citizen here. Maybe if I try to use my proxy server and pop out in Europe, maybe it'll give me that option. But at the moment, this is only appearing, at least in my research, uh, to EU citizens. But this is uh, the extent of all the data they've been collecting on you and sending to all these different companies who have undoubtedly been selling that information to others as well. And it kind of shows you the extent of this problem and how much information has been collected about private citizens over the years. So what happens if you are found in violation of the GDPR? Well, you will be facing fines up to 20 million euros or 4% of your profit, whichever is greater. Uh, they wanted to put in place a penalty uh, that was more expensive than non-compliance. A lot of times you can you know, just pay the fine and move on with your life. They wanted to make it impossible to do that. And if you are an Apple, a Google, or a Facebook, uh, this is a significant amount of money if they're going to come after 4% of your company's profits, uh, which could be quite a bit for those companies. But I don't think any of these uh, fines are ever going to happen because of how they structured enforcement of the law. So if you see here on the actual uh, law here itself, uh, the data subject shall have the right to mandate a not-for-profit body organization or association uh, to go after and sue these companies, essentially allowing for private enforcement of this law, which means that I think in most cases, these GDPR cases are going to be settled out of court before it rises to a fine that might come from the EU. Because in addition to the fine, uh, if you feel your data privacy has been violated, uh, you're entitled to some damages. And whenever lawyers get involved and whenever things are privately enforced like this, Ultimately, that means uh, there's going to be some compensation involved for the lawyers, in addition to perhaps the class that they're representing. But as we all know in these class action cases, the, law the lawyers do better than the people do typically. And if you look here on this last line of paragraph one, uh, they have the right to receive compensation on behalf of that 
person if they are being represented by one of these not-for-profit bodies. And don't let the not-for-profit thing fool you. People can make a lot of money in nonprofits, including uh, the lawyers that represent those nonprofits in these GDPR cases. So this is going to be, uh, I think, the biggest problem with this law in that the government is really not the enforcer of it. They've allowed uh, organizations to privately enforce the law, and I think there's going to be a significant profit motive to find every little thing they can uh, to find these companies in violation and continually collect settlements from them. So what has happened so far since this law has been enacted? Well, guess what? There's already a lawsuit being filed. Uh, you can read about it here on Axios. And here's the kicker. Uh, this guy Schrems here, via a nonprofit, has filed complaints against Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Google's Android on behalf of unnamed individuals, arguing that the companies are violating the GDPR through their all-or-nothing user consent prompts. And uh, this is likely going to test the law and exactly uh, what you can or cannot do insofar as allowing this consent to be collected from the user. Uh, but ultimately, I think they're going to be after money here, and they probably won't get fined, but there'll be a settlement, and they'll continue suing every time they have an opportunity to do so. But here we go. The law is being enforced by a private entity, and this, I think, is not a good thing for business on the Internet in Europe. So we will have to see what happens there. Another thing that happened is that The Verge uh, has provided EU viewers with an option. Uh, they get that consent thing, and if you uh, just X out the consent screen, the site now loads significantly faster. Uh, so Marshall Freinbeichler here found that uh, The Verge loads up in five seconds versus 32 when you have all of the data tracking enabled because there's all this JavaScript that runs in the background. Uh, when you visit The Verge. Now, what I do is I use uh, uBlock Origin, which uh, already does a lot of what that action would do uh, by opting out. So these sites do load a lot faster when you opt out of your data being collected by all these people. And other sites have decided that they just cannot uh, be able to get themselves compliant. So the Arizona Daily Star, which is a newspaper here in the United States, has just decided to block anybody coming to the site from Europe rather than uh, face the risk of getting sued by one of these folks. And it might be hard to sue a newspaper in the U.S. that doesn't have an EU presence, but uh, their parent company might have some activity there, and they just don't want to deal with the settlements and the private enforcement of this law. So they said, you know what, we're just going to cancel out all the EU visitors to our site, and I think this raises some other issues insofar as a truly worldwide Internet being accessible from everywhere in the world. So I am very concerned about... Uh, how they decided to enforce this law. I think the merits of it, as always with these types of regulations, are good merits that we're trying to do the right thing and you know, get people aware of what information has been collected about them. But to do it through a private enforcement mechanism, I think, is a road to disaster, especially for the European economy. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I think, ultimately, there's going to be a lot of companies that decide just to opt out of Europe completely, just given uh, how likely it is they're going to get sued over this or uh, just block their sites out completely. Now, my Q&A for you this week is about the GDPR and what you think of it. I especially want to hear from uh, my friends in the European Union about how it impacts you and whether or not you think it's a good thing or a bad thing. Let me know down in the comments below. And our channel of the week this week is Splash Wave, and this is a great channel that uh, does these little mini retro video game documentaries, their most recent one on the development of Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Incredibly well produced, really good information. You learn something on every one of these videos. Just like when you thought you knew everything, these guys have something else that you didn't know about. Uh, definitely check it out at lon.tv slash splashwave, and hopefully we can get some more subscribers for their very high quality content. They get a lot of views per video, uh, but I think they certainly deserve more subscribers than the 24,000 they have now. So this week, we got a couple of things on the docket. The first one is the Lenovo Flex 6. This is an 11-inch low-end laptop powered by a new Gemini Lake processor. It is fanless, and we'll see how this one performs compared to some of those NUCs we looked at recently that also has that new low-end Intel processor that I was quite impressed with on uh, those NUCs. We'll see how well it does in a fanless laptop design, so stay tuned for that. It is a two-in-one, by the way. I think it's under 300 bucks, so not too bad there. I'm also hopefully going to get to the Oculus Go this week. I don't get a lot of views on VR stuff. I don't think there's a lot of consumer interest in this stuff, but I am still looking for some suggestions of things that you would like to know about the product that were not covered elsewhere, so definitely let me know what I should cover with it if uh, other folks haven't gotten you what you needed out of your reviews. And of course, I'll have some other stuff to review as the week progresses here. I'm just coming out of this 
uh, cold or whatever it is I've had, and I can't think very well at the moment, but I will find some other stuff to review before the week is out. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We also have our ongoing relationship with Plex, my favorite media server, where if you sign up for a free Plex account, no credit card required, we get a small commission. We get a larger commission if you sign up for a Plex Pass or gift it to somebody else. So you can see that uh, on the links there. We have other channels to check out, including the Extras channel for unboxings and supplementary content. We have the podcast at lon.tv slash podcast, which has audio versions of this show and uh, interviews once a month. And I, I'm going to talk next week about some of the hidden gems of my podcast feed, because I got stuff going back uh, three or four years with some really interesting people. So you may want to go back through the feed there and find something to listen to that you might like. We've got the Snippets channel that has search-friendly components of this show and a few other things that I do. And my live stream archive is at lon.tv slash live streams, which I do hope to resurrect at some point in the future. And if you like what I do, I suggest you click on that bell to get notified. Subscribing is no longer enough, folks, because the algorithm determines what you see. So click on that bell if you want to get notified every time I do something. We also have the email list at lon.tv slash email. The Facebook page is at lon.tv slash Facebook. We've got a great Facebook group that is always got activity in it at lon.tv slash Facebook group. Over 300 of you have joined that. And we have the store at lon.tv slash store where I sell items that I have previously purchased to review here on the channel and I'm now getting rid of. And if you want to be notified every time I update the store, you can go to lon.tv slash store alert and I'll send out an email every time I add something to the store. So that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. And I want to end by acknowledging Memorial Day, which is a national holiday here in the United States that is taking place today. And this is a holiday where we Americans reflect on the sacrifices made by our men and women in uniform who defended our country and I think have done a lot to keep the world safe as well. And I want to thank uh, everyone who is currently serving, all those who have served. I also want to acknowledge the families of service men and women who sacrifice a lot to help protect this country and the world. So thank you to everybody for everything that you have contributed. And uh, we also reflect and think about those who gave their lives in service of their country. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters of the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.